Show on this uh, Monday evening, beginning a new week. Glad you're here. Nice crowd here at Rudy's. Thanks to those of you listening and watching. And folks, join me in welcoming Coach Jim Grove this evening. Coach, welcome to you. Appreciate you, you being here. Good to be here. I got here right on time. Oh, you're perfect. perfect. Your timing right. is we had at least absolutely 10 perfect. seconds to spare. That's all you need, yeah, right? Absolutely. How about uh, 88 degrees on the last day of October here in Waco? Pretty I like nice, it. huh? I'm, you know, I'm a warm weather I know you guy, are. so I like it. It's okay. Holly now would like it a little cooler. Right. But, uh, she's she's wait, still waiting for fall. We'll have uh, we'll have fall one afternoon coming up very shortly. Okay. All right, Coach. Glad you're here tonight, and uh, let's talk about uh, most recent game, the game in Austin. One point loss to the Longhorns. Tough loss in that you had a lot of opportunities. You did a lot of really good things on Saturday. Still came home with the one-point hickey. Yeah, really disappointing, uh, John. I thought, uh, you know, we did a lot of good things. We had, you know, 630 yards of offense to their 540-something, and we had 31 first downs to their 19 first downs, and uh, really did a lot of good things, had a lot of good individual performances, over 400 yards rushing. I thought uh, Seth did some really, really good things. Uh, uh, Terrence Williams had a great game. Uh, you know, just a lot of good things. But playing on the road's tough. We had a great opportunity fourth quarter. I think we're up eight points and really kind of doing good stuff. And then, you know, didn't make some plays, and they got back in it and kicked a field goal late, and uh, you know, we didn't have any timeouts left, and so it made it tough. But uh, really proud of our kids. Uh, disappointed that we lost our focus a little bit. I think our guys got a little bit too concerned about officiating during the game, and that's a lesson. It's my fault. Uh, you know, early in the season, I, I talk about that all the time, that the officials don't uh, – determine the outcome of a game you just got to go play and focus on doing your job and uh, I think our guys got a little bit out of shape and coaches about uh, some things early and that kind of carried over throughout the game and so a great lesson for our kids to learn especially on the road when you're on the road it's tough enough uh, and then if you worry about anything you don't have any control over that's another bad thing and so you really just got to play and so uh, all in all I uh, you know, we on the road in front of a big crowd, had a chance to win, didn't get it done, so we're really disappointed about that. I talked to the players yesterday about going forward. You know, what do you do going forward? And I think uh, where you find out the character of your program is how you respond to adversity. And through six games, we didn't play our best football every second, but we had won all six. And so now that we've lost one, it's going to be interesting to, to see how our kids bounce back. But I... Uh, you know, think we did some really, really good things. We really just made too many mistakes on both sides of the ball. I think we gave up, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, six or seven uh, long plays defensively. I'm talking long plays. I'm talking over 30-yard plays, uh, some runs and throws that weren't good. We had a lot of long plays offensively, but uh, had a couple turnovers that really hurt us. Uh, got down in, in scoring uh, position a couple times and, and uh, had some penalties and some different things caused us to go backwards a little bit and didn't get, instead of, you know, kicking field goals, we should have been scoring touchdowns down there. And so uh, it, it's, you know, I hate to say this, but it's really a team loss. You know, this is one of those losses where nobody can point fingers. I told our players after the game, you got to be thumb pointers. You know, you got to look in the mirror and say, hey, I should have played better. Don't be pointing here and there thinking the defense should have done this or the offense should have done this or special teams should have done this. It's really a situation where probably everybody on our football team came back home thinking they could have played a little better. And we just needed probably just one more good play in the game and, and we get over the hump and get a good road win. But uh, uh, I'm hopeful that our, our team will learn from it. You mentioned uh, playing on the road. You've talked about that a lot. Going into the weekend, there were nine undefeated teams in college football. Seven of those nine were playing on the road this past weekend. Four of those seven lost yeah. on the road. So yeah. four teams that, that uh, had a perfect record up until this weekend lost on the road. Well, and a lot of the teams that, uh, you know, this time of year you're playing better teams. And, you know, Texas, uh, even though Texas had lost four football games, they'd lost every one of their games on the road. They'd won all three at home and lost four road games. So it's just tough getting on the road and in, in front of a hostile crowd. Uh, it, it, you know, everything's tougher. You're fighting uphill on the road. The thing that disappoints me is that, that physically 
we had the ability to get the job done. We just didn't do the little things that you need to do to win games on the road. You know, sometimes some stats from a game, sometimes they're, they're glaring and they really point out uh, a deficiency or, or a positive. Uh, the one about penalties this week is kind of hidden in that if you look at it, 10 penalties, which is too many, but 10 penalties for 39 yards yeah. doesn't seem yeah. that bad. But, man, it turned out to be a killer, didn't it? Well, a couple drives. Uh, you know, one of the uh, situations that we had is we had a uh, false start on, on one of our drives, we got down really close. We're, you know, we're just really doing good things, running, throwing, everything's going well. And then we have a, a, a legal procedure. You know, our wide receiver jumped. Uh, and then we have a lineman jump. And now instead of first and 10, you're first and 20. And we, don't, we end up not getting points there. And those are the kind of things, if you look at it, we didn't have really uh, – we had the holding penalty was major because it gave us a safety. We're backed up on the two-yard line. Uh, and that was bad. But a lot of the penalties were five-yard variety yeah. penalties. Uh, one of the things that I was very disappointed in was, uh, you know, when we had uh, too many people on the field, mm -hmm. you know, and a couple times guys decided that they were going to substitute themselves, <laughs> and we end up with 12 guys. And the problem is once they get out there on the field and get, get on the field, and then they realize, hey, no, I can't be here. i got to come off. That that's you, you can't do that. So that's a penalty. And I know one time, uh, you know, we had told the kids we want to be in our three man front stuff. And Xavier goes out and he's our fourth man. And so we ended up with an extra guy on defense. And so those are the little things that don't really seem to be a big deal. Ten penalties for what, 39 yards, 39 38 yards, yards yeah. whatever. That seems like really small potatoes in the in the large scheme of things, but it's those little things that make the difference, especially on the road. Typically, at home, you overcome some of those problems. On the road, they seem to magnify. How about uh, Seth Russell, your senior quarterback, 138 yards rushing, second most he's ever had in a game, 50-yard touchdown run that got you off to a great start. And and uh, to be honest, I really didn't know this until, uh, until Sunday that he had some concussion-like symptoms that really didn't show up until later. Saturday night. Yeah, we had no idea, uh, J-Mo. We, you know, during the course of the game, I uh, spent a lot of time talking to him and, and, and keeping an eye on him, and he took some pretty good hits during the game, but he seemed fine. I don't think K, uh, KB or any of our offensive coaches noticed any problems. And then uh, after the game in the locker room, you know, I went up to him, gave him a hug, told him, you know, keep your head up, thought he played good, and he was smiling and, and seemed fine. Uh and then that night I got a call or a text from Mike Sims saying that he'd gone to, to uh, dinner that evening with his fiance and got nauseous at dinner and was lightheaded and had having problems with light. You know, that's typically a concussion sy symptom. So we don't know whether he had a concussion or not, but he had those kind of symptoms. And so you have to do the concussion protocol. Mike feels really good about that. They do mental tests and physical tests and make sure that he's not got any residual effects from the game. But, uh, you know, everybody, you know, knock on wood, keep your fingers crossed that he's healthy and ready to go for TCU Saturday. Man, he took some really, uh, really hard hits on he Saturday. He really, really did. He? did. he really did. And uh, what, a, what a warrior. I mean, he just kept coming back and coming back and made some mistakes. You know, he's, that's, that's the thing. You know, when Seth Russell makes some mistakes, uh, it, it's hard to point fingers at anybody because there's nobody works harder, tries to, tries to be more perfect uh, than Seth. But. You know, all of our kids can look at themselves and say, hey, I could have made one or two more plays that would have been the difference. So I think it's a, as a team thing, it can help us grow quite a bit. All right, let's take a break. Uh, back with more in a moment. Continue to look and uh, rehash the uh, Texas game from Saturday. And TCU coming to town this week. Glad you're with us. This is the Baylor Coaches Show live from Rudy's. And we'll be right back after this. Back live from Rudy's on the Circle in Waco. Rudy's Real Texas Barbecue, also brought to you in part by John McLaren Chevrolet, the official Chevrolet dealership of Baylor Athletics. John Morris, Coach Jim Grobe. Holly Grobe's in the back there with some uh, with some relatives yeah, with you here this sister, evening. Sister Helen's here, and uh, her husband Larry's here. Hey, welcome to uh, you, folks. Make them feel welcome back there. Glad y'all are here. You guys stick around for a little bit. 
Watch the, some Baylor football? Yeah, they, they actually were at the game this this Saturday, this past Saturday, and they're going to stick around for TCU. Very so nice. All right, they need to see a win, so uh, yeah, let's yeah, make yeah. that happen. All right, uh, glad you're with us uh, to sort of uh, going through the uh, Baylor-Texas game from Saturday. 106th meeting all time between Baylor and Texas. thought it was interesting before the game, they're they're uh, they're they're making you feel welcome. They're rolling out the red carpet for you. And I look down there. I don't know if they showed this on TV or if y'all saw it, but uh, a group or a couple of groups uh, made a presentation to you before the game. Yeah, it was very uh, kind. I, I thought it was really nice. They gave me a big cowboy hat and some spurs. I don't know if I can wear my spurs on my tennis shoes or not, but I, got, I guess I got to get a pair of boots now. But uh, gave me the cowboy hats. Really, really cool. And uh, uh, the only thing I did, though, is I made sure the team had already gone in the locker room before <laughs> that. Let them see me put a cowboy hat on. For, and you didn't keep it on yeah, very long. No, 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 no. I don't want anybody to think I had any mixed feelings right. about who should win that one. That's great. Uh, well, it's a good, that's a good look for you. You know, like today's Halloween. You could have broken out the your new yep, cowboy hat. Yep. I got to get some boots so if I'm going to wear a cowboy hat. You have I got think. to get some yeah. boots before you yep, leave Texas. I do. All I right. do. All right, let's work on that. Let's talk about your defense from Saturday. Uh, what about Graylin Arnold, who got his second consecutive start at corner for you? But it was a short day for him. Uh, uh, well, what's well, his status? Well, he, it's going to be a while, I think. He's going through the same thing Seth's going through, uh, you know, kind of a concussion protocol. But he couldn't go to class today. He's still having some effects from that. Uh, I, I don't know how – I'm, I'm almost – I would guarantee he can't be back this week, you know, but young kids bounce back a little bit quicker. What actually happened to him is he was covering a kickoff, and we had him starting at corner. You know, we maybe should have had somebody else covering kickoffs, but uh, when he went in to make the tackle, his head snapped back, and that's a problem. But then as he's going to the ground, he got he was run into and hit right in the head then. And then when he got on the ground, one of the guys coming by kicked him in Good the head. Grief, and it, it wasn't anything yeah. intentional. It just all happened. You know, it was like bang, like the triple whammy. Yeah. And uh, so he was he was out of it for a while. And uh, uh, when he when he kind of cleared up a little bit, you know, I had him by the hand. He squeezed my hand. And he was moving his legs and right. stuff. So I felt better about him. And, I uh, told him I loved him, and he got a smile on his face. So I felt better. I knew he heard what I said, and uh, uh, and then they put him on and took him in and did all the all the things they needed to do at the hospital. And he was actually back in our locker room at the end of the game and uh, didn't didn't. I'm not sure he knew he was in a locker room, but he was back with us uh, by the end of the game, and he'll, he'll be fine. It's just uh, one of those things. He got caught in an awkward position and got hit pretty good. What is that, uh, that process, the, the, the uh, uh, concussion protocol, so he and, and Seth would be going through Going through week. the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Mike Sims could tell you uh, a little bit more. The way we used to do it, when you came in to start August practice before you could start, they would give you kind of a battery of mental things, you know, asking you certain questions, uh, some questions that I would never be able to answer, things like, you know, count back to 70 by threes from 100, you know, and I'd go, <laughs> Jeez, you know, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm trying to do that, you know. Uh, but then they time it and see how much, how long it takes you to get back to 70 and things like that. Uh, they might ask you who the president is or, you know, uh, you know who, who the quarterback for the Jets is and yeah. things like that. And then figure out how much time it takes you to answer all those questions. And then if you, if you may have had a concussion, they go back and ask you all those battery of questions. Huh. And if you can't answer them in the same amount of time, then they know that you're not quite there mentally. And I don't know how they do that now. I don't know what Mike's tests are, but they'll do – Basically, they're doing a, a mental group of things to kind of exercise mentally to make sure you're sharp. And I think he's, he's, he seems to be really, really good. Uh, and then they take you out and they gradually start exercising you because typically if you've had a concussion after a concussion and you start to exercise, it makes you nauseous again. You know, you get sick, get dizzy and all those kind of things. So they had him on the exercise bike earlier today and seemed to pass that fine. Good, and good. I know what Mike Sims, our trainer, was going to do was give him a little bit more workout to do, uh, work him a little bit harder, get him up to a pace to see if he can handle it. 
And then if he can handle it, I think he'll get some practice tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Mike Sims, he said, uh, you know, if we get him back out on the practice field tomorrow and let him throw the ball a little bit, we just got to make sure he doesn't get hit. And I said, Mike, we never let that guy get hit yeah. in practice. So <laughs> we don't let him get run into. But uh, I, I just got a good feeling about it. I think he's going to be fine. Good, good. That's good news. On the, the other side of the coin, uh, we thought Bravion Roy would not play uh, on Saturday. He's got that – brace on his elbow that he hyperextended where at Iowa State yep. and look down there in warm-ups and Heath Nielsen comes in and says uh, Bravion suited up and I said really I said you think you'll play and he said I don't know but he got in didn't he, he? did he get in a little bit uh, what we did is we actually took him because he's a true freshman and we really just wanted to give him that experience of being in a hostile environment, big stadium, kind of see what it's like to go on the road and play the big teams and uh once we got, got uh, on the trip, uh, Mike Sims felt like his strength had come back pretty good and that he didn't feel like he was going to hurt himself. The problem is we hadn't really practiced him much. He'd been studying, you know, tips and reminders for the defense but really had not gotten any practice time. So we played him a little bit, but mainly I think, you know, played him early and, and uh, really wanted to get him, you know, back in a little bit. And hopefully this week he'll get to play a lot. Man, that's great. That's yeah, good news to good. have him that back. That would be good. What would you think about uh, another one sort of inside the numbers? You look at red zone, and Baylor was five of six scoring in the red zone. The one you didn't score on was that fumble by yeah. Michael Hasty, and that was that was costly. But then the other – a little more, more inside, the first three were touchdowns. The last two in the red zone were field goals. And having to settle for field goals ultimately uh, sort of hurt you, didn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, it, you know, what it really hurts you a lot is when you rush the ball for over 400 yards and you have 630 yards of offense. And what you really end up with is – if you look at those stats, you know, the number of first downs, the number of rushing yards, the number of total yards, you look at those stats, and, and you got to understand the two turnovers balanced out. They had two, we had two, so the turnovers were a wash. So when you look at those numbers, that's when it really – disappoints you that you came away with field goals and one time nothing and twice with yeah. field goals when you had that much offense you ought to be getting the ball in the end zone and scoring touchdowns and so that was a uh, you know bad feeling to have those kind of numbers with that a, a, a lot of numbers without a lot of scoring mm. you know which which is tough like great stats everywhere but on the scoreboard let me ask you this, and I don't want to get you in trouble, so uh, slap me if you don't want to go here at all. Whack, whack. But uh, there were seven reviews during that game. I've never seen a game with that many. And even some of the reviews seemed to be inconclusive and left fans on both sides saying, well, what are you looking at there? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I don't want you to comment on the officiating because that would get both of us mm -hmm. in trouble. Well, we could say it was great. And that you wouldn't say get that. you in yeah. trouble. That wouldn't get you they in get trouble. get you in trouble with somebody else here. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, with, with all the reviews, you said early on that uh, maybe the players lost a little focus because of the officiating. Yeah, I think, you know, a couple times there were things that our guys thought, you know, should have been called or, or, or were called that, that were a little bit, uh, you know, out of line. But I told our players, let me, let me tell everybody this, and this is the way it is. Officials never want to get it wrong. They, they want to be perfect. They want to do a good job. The game's gotten so fast. I mean, it's just so fast today. The kids are so big and fast and strong. And you're making those decisions just like that as an official so, so hard. And I, I used to think that my job as a coach was tougher than the official's job. And now I believe the official's job's harder trying to call these games with all these great players. The thing that you do have that helps is, is instant replay. But what we found out Saturday, and you find out every week when you watch it, that's not always conclusive. You know, a lot of times an official's in the way or the guy that's getting tackled or that's the tackler's in the way and you can't really see, did the ball touch the ground, didn't it touch the ground, uh, all those type things. So the instant replays were forever the other day. I mean, on one hand, as a coach, you want to get it right. You want them to take their time and get it right. But, man, did that make for a long game oh. to wait. And, of course, with Grayland being hurt, that was a long time. And uh, so – 
I, I think overall, uh, I never criticize officials because I promise you, they're always doing the best job they can. Uh, and I would not, I, I would not feel comfortable doing that job. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness we've got guys that are committed and loyal and all those kind of things. But there are always questions that pop up, and that's why I was disappointed in our kids. Guys, let's play football. Forget, forget the officiating part. You know, maybe this call was good. Maybe this call was bad. Who cares? Let's just go play. By the time the game's over, it probably all washes out. And the thing that I did point it out, and you mentioned it earlier, J-Mo, but if you look at the, you know, the – illegal procedures and having too many men on the field and jumping off sides on defense and those things, anybody in the stadium can call those. Mm -hmm. You know, those are things that we did to ourselves that we can't do, that it didn't involve judgment. Holding involves judgment. Pass interference involves judgment. But some of the things that we had of those ten penalties, a lot of those were self-inflicted wounds. So point going forward, let's play football and don't worry about it. All right, good point, good approach there. Let's take a break. We'll be back with more in a moment. This is the Baylor Coaches Show from Rudy's on the Circle in Waco. Rudy's Real Texas Barbecue. And we'll be right back. Back with us live from Rudy's. Appreciate you being with us this evening. Brought to you in part by Dubois Furniture. Dubois Furniture is excited to again give Baylor Nation the chance to cheer on the Bears in style. Enter to win the Baylor Fan Cave giveaway in store or online. Dubois Furniture where beautiful homes happen. Also brought to you in part by uh, Spinco Medical, orthotic grade footwear for ultimate comfort and support. Spinco, love your feet. These great uh, sandals we've shown you and talked about. Uh, Coach, you like these? Holly oh, has a pair gosh, of these. Oh, gosh, I love those. They're really, I really nice. Those. We just just wearing them this weekend. Very good. It's warm enough, that is yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Todd Berry is here this evening, folks. Coach, uh, appreciate you being with us. Todd is the new executive director of the American Football Coaches Association based right here in Waco. So, uh, Coach Berry, it's good to have you with us here uh, in Waco and at the show coming up this evening. Taking over for Coach Taft. He doesn't have big shoes to fill. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we were talking about uh, the officials in such a nice way. And, and I, I would tell you that I said on the air what, uh, what you were just saying, how hard the officials work. They have a, a conference uh, clinic over the summer, and they invite the media to come in and watch and see the process. And I go every summer that I can because it is so impressive to see how hard they work, how much tape they look at, and they run it back and forth and back and forth. Was this targeting? Was it not? Why wasn't yeah. it? What was, The call was made or not made. I mean, those guys are really impressive how hard they work at getting the calls right. There's no question. And they have to be in shape. You know, uh, yeah. they, ha they have to, uh, you know, run certain times, a uh, mile and whatever. I, I don't know how they do it here. ACC had to pass a running test. And, uh, of course, they have to pass a uh, mental test, you know, as far as rules and all those kind of things. Uh, and, and the one thing that I hated is they always wanted, in the ACC, uh, Doug Rhodes, who was our, our commissioner, head of the officials, he always wanted guys that were in shape. So he was always kind of pushing the old guys away and trying to bring the young guys in because they're in shape and can run. Really? And I said, I said, you know, Doug, I want guys with gray hair officiating. I want guys that have been there before. And what you really want is an official, especially on judgment calls, things like, uh, you know, targeting or, or uh, holding or pass interference, those kind of penalties. What you want as a coach is you want somebody that's been around a little while. When he sees it, he kind of goes, man, I can't believe he just did that. And then here comes the right, flag. Right. Instead of the younger guys that have that flag out and they realize I, I probably shouldn't be throwing this and they're trying to reach yeah. and pull it back. Right. And so that's kind of you – you need a good mix with old guys and young guys. But they work at it. They really do. And, and they're not professional – officials you know these guys have other jobs so they're really doing it out of their heart more than anything else and they don't want to ever get it wrong they want to get it right all the time so that being said the targeting call uh non-targeting call against seth which they looked at wasn't made the the call wasn't made on the field but knew this year a replay official in the booth can make that call and signal down to the uh to the field, and then they looked at it, but it wasn't targeting, or they well, didn't rule it was targeting. As you know, that they uh, they looked at it for a long, a time. long time. A lot of the reviews, they looked at them for a long time. Uh, here's the deal with targeting, and I won't give my opinion as to what I think in that situation, uh, but the the deal with targeting is, first of all, it's, it's more apt to happen to a quarterback in the pocket. It's in the pocket passing, and a rusher comes in and, and hits him high, hits him in the helmet. 
Uh, but once a quarterback's out of the pocket, he's a runner. He's not protected like the quarterback in the pocket. He's treated like a running back now. He's not treated anymore like a quarterback. And, of course, our hearts with Seth Russell, knowing that what he's been through health-wise, we want him protected. But actually, when we run him, he's seen no differently by the officials than a running back, okay? The first thing they look at with targeting is did the defender have the intention of targeting? Was he trying to drop his head to hurt the runner? Was that his intention? Now, to be real honest with you, I think that's a gray area. I, I don't know how you figure out what was in his head. Was he, was he trying to drop his head in order to hurt the, you know, the guy carrying the football? So that, I think that's a tough thing to try to determine. And then the second thing that you've got to determine is what part of his helmet hit the runner. And... Uh, you know, uh, it's the crown of the helmet. It's, you know, if you're not hitting with your face mask, if it's the top part of your helmet, then that's, that's, that's targeting. And, uh, you know, so obviously the officials thought two things. They thought, first of all, he wasn't intentionally trying to hurt the quarterback or, or the runner, I should say, because that's what Seth was when he was running with the ball. And then secondly, he didn't hit Seth with the top of his helmet. So uh, how, you, how you determine that is probably a judgment call. Yeah. It's probably more judgment than anything else, and that's why they send it up to the booth and let them run it over and over and over. The thing I don't like about targeting, and this is the one thing I don't like with this rule, is if you're guilty of targeting, you have to miss a whole football game. So that means that whatever half you're in, you miss the rest of that half, and then you miss the next half. So say that happens to you in the second half, you're out for that half, and then you miss the first half of the next game. So to me, that's a really severe penalty. And I think what happens with officials, they really – if they're going to err, they err on the side of not being that, not giving that penalty because it's so severe. I'd like to see targeting be a penalty where, yeah, go ahead, give them 15 yards. You thought it was targeting. Uh, we're going to give you 15-yard penalty. And if it happens again, you get a second one, now there's a chance that okay. you could lose a game. Mm -hmm. But the first penalty so severe, missing a whole game for a penalty, and a lot of times those things happen like this. You know, I talk about how fast, big, fast, and physical the kids are now. Those things happen so fast that sometimes you're getting ready to make a tackle and that head drops down, and you're not really trying to launch into a guy and hurt him. You're just trying to make a play. Right. And uh, so it's a, it's a judgment call, and, and you know, probably depending on – which fans looking at it, that's yeah, right. the way it's going to be going to be interpreted. Well, we could probably spend an hour uh, talking about what is targeting, what is not targeting, but uh, we'll move on here. In fact, we've got a guest with us tonight. Uh, we'll take a break, and when we come back, Baylor junior kicker Chris Callahan is with us tonight. We'll Thank hear you. from him when we come back. Let's take a break. We'll be right back on the Baylor Coaches Show. On the Baylor Coaches Show, I want to remind you about our pregame tailgate concert series. This is sponsored by TFNB, your bank for life, and HEB Plus. Takes place each home game outside McLean Stadium just after the Bear Walk. Visit any TFNB, your bank for life location, or HEB Plus around Waco to enter to win a VIP pregame experience. And folks, join me in welcoming Baylor kicker Chris Callahan is with us tonight. Welcome to you. Appreciate you coming in. Absolutely. Very nice. Very nice. Congratulations on uh, you. Uh, it was a loss, but you were four for four on extra points. You were two for two on field goals. Uh, how did it feel to have a, a good day kicking the ball? You know, it's always great to uh, to have a great day kicking, but, you know, ultimately it's it's about winning uh, and the team finishing on top. So. Yeah just didn't happen this week. You understand if we say we wish you'd had one or, or maybe two less field goals the other day. Absolutely. You know where I'm coming from yes, there. Sir. <laughs> I think I, I'd even appreciate that, yeah. Sure, absolutely. What about that crowd? Uh, I never did see what the official attendance was. Big old place, close to 100,000 on Saturday. Yeah, and, you know, growing up from Texas, you know, you go to DKR. I grew up going to DKR with my family, and so it was just someplace – but I, I've always wanted to play at, and mm -hmm. it's it's a great atmosphere. So you, you got to give it to them for bringing that crowd. Yeah, you guys uh, handled it. Seemed like you handled the crowd pretty well on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, uh, we didn't really have much uh, any interference uh, from the crowd on our sideline. Yeah. Didn't have any 
people say anything. So yeah. just kind of block everything else out. Part of it is they're they're not right on top of you. They're a little bit back. Aren't right, they? which which is helpful. That is good. Yes, sir. All right, let's talk about TCU coming in this weekend. Chris, do you have any particular memories about Baylor versus TCU? Anything <laughs> stand out in your mind? <laughs> One or two in particular, but uh, but yeah, no. Uh, of course, the 2014 was a really special year for Baylor, and um, specifically that. Um, I guess that year at the TCU game it just kind of turned and propelled us to move on and, and go to the Cotton Bowl, and so it was just a big year. So Really big. And uh, what do you remember about that game? Y'all were 21 points down. You, you started making a comeback, scored really fast uh, in that fourth quarter to make a game of it. Then it came down to your kick that won it 61-58. Well, and of course, you always you have to give it to the offense for always setting you up like that because, you know, as a kicker, you can't, you know, be on the other side of the field and try to kick a, <laughs> a long field goal. But so you got to give it to Bryce back then and um, in shock uh, leading up to that. But, of course, it's, it's always great to get a game-winning field goal. Yeah. Wasn't that uh, as electric an atmosphere as we've had? I mean, it's short time, but at McLean Stadium, that might have been the best, that fourth quarter and then your game-winning kick. Absolutely, especially in McLean's opening year. Uh, that just, I guess, <laughs> it's going to be hard to beat that moment in future years to come, yeah. but hopefully we have more something like that. Good. Huge win, and like you said, propelled you guys uh, on to a conference championship and the Cotton Bowl, uh, and that was a big part of it. Uh, how do you feel about the rivalry with TCU? It's uh, uh, revivalry is the way some people refer to it. Uh, it's turned uh, to be a really good rivalry. Yeah, it's a great uh, rivalry and, um, you know, two great teams uh, always. And so we just have to go into it with focus and um, the right game plan and just execute. Good. Last year, uh, a memorable game for a little different reasons. Uh, is that about as bad a weather as you've ever played in? I don't think you could ask for anything worse. Uh, that monsoon, hurricane, snowstorm going on, <laughs> right. ice storm. Uh, I can't tell you how many socks I went through just trying to keep my feet dry. Uh. Um, two different pairs of cleats. So just trying to you know keep yourself uh, at the highest level. Yeah. So now this week the challenge is uh, trying to bounce back from the loss to Texas. Uh, you don't want that to turn into two, and you got them at home. So take advantage of the home field this week. Absolutely, and people always talk about um, coming off an emotional win or a loss, you always have to come back and bounce back. And I think that that's one thing that this team will do is we're resilient. We have that leadership that can lead us to um, a victory. Good. Yeah, Second Baptist High School is where uh, Chris went to school in the Houston area. What was it about uh, uh, Baylor? How would you end up here? What was that recruitment process uh, like? Honestly, you know, KB called me a week, 10 days before signing day. And um, I, I had small um, – small other offers to other schools and um, not to downplay them, but Baylor was my biggest, biggest yep. uh, offer. So um, it's proximity to Houston and my family and especially my mother. That was uh, something really big to me, um, let alone the Christian environment and the academics uh, just um, it was really helpful. It was great. It was easy to make a decision. And you came in, and the kicking job was was open. It was open competition, and you made the most of it as a freshman. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it even started with Aaron Jones with his leadership, um, kind of taking me um, under his wing and showing me where to go. Uh, so that was helpful. And then kind of figuring it out um, my sophomore year, my uh, redshirt freshman year, figuring out academics, um, my schedule with – Football, so it, it, it was great. It was uh, freshman year was uh, obviously the TCU game. It was, yeah. it was fun. Pretty memorable for sure. Yes, what sir. are you majoring in? I'm a political science major. Really? Yes, sir. So we're almost to election day. Yes, huh? yes, we well, are. We don't have enough time to get into your uh, political. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> do we? No, sir. <laughs> it's probably best that we stick to football. Football only. Yeah, but is this has this been an interesting uh, political presidential race? It has. No, absolutely, but. Uh, I, right now, I'm not in any necessarily political classes. Uh, oh, you're not? Yeah, I'm uh -huh. towards the end of my uh, degree plan. So, okay. But uh, you have an interest that way. I, no, absolutely. But, uh, again, we'll keep it football. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Smart guy. Very good. Well, we're looking forward to the uh, Frogs here this weekend. Good luck, and thanks for being with us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Chris Callahan, folks, with us, Baylor junior kicker from Houston. Take a break, and uh, your questions, questions from the audience for Coach Grove when we come back. This is the Baylor Coaches Show, and we'll be right back. 
Welcome back live from Rudy's, Rudy's Real Texas Barbecue, and glad you're with us. John Morris, Coach Jim Grove alongside, and each Monday if you uh, come to the show, you have a chance to ask questions and win fabulous prizes, but have your questions asked on air of Coach Grove. So uh, that's where we are in the program now. Let me make a point also, uh, two weeks from now, our show will be on a Tuesday, uh, so no show on November 14th, uh, Monday night. Lady Bear basketball plays a big game against UCLA in the Farrell Center at 6 p.m. on that Monday night. So we'll shift to Tuesday, November 15th. So keep that in mind. Uh, you come to Rudy's if you'd like on November 14th, but we won't be here. And then come back on the 15th. Two we nights be in a row, barbecue. That great. wouldn't be bad. Be no, fun. it wouldn't be yeah. bad at all. So uh, we'll remind you that the next couple of weeks. Coach, here are some questions that have been asked from those here in our audience. And uh, Clark, what are you giving for prizes this evening? What? Socks. Oh. Sauce. Okay. Sauce. There we go. <laughs> he said socks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Uh, I'm wearing these headsets, you know. So here's our first question from uh, Cole uh, Streelman. Where's Cole? Cole is right here. Hey, okay. You're going to get some Rudy sauce to take home. Coach, his question is your thoughts on Terrence Williams who had a fantastic game Saturday, wow. career high. And based on his performance, will he be playing more? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, we feel like we've got three really good running backs. And, of course, Terrence had the great day against Texas. Uh, it was disappointing. He got the fourth quarter. He's got a, a problem with his knee. It's not a serious problem, but he's got a – where he got hit on the kneecap, uh, it's, it's bruised a tendon. And you, I don't know if you noticed him in the fourth quarter limping around a little bit. Uh, we think he'll be full speed for Saturday, but he's a beast now. Big back, big running back, uh, a, a slasher kind of guy. He picks the holes really, really well. Uh, rushed for a buck eighty uh, down in Austin, and uh, you know he, he's got to play a lot more. He's just just really, really good. Uh, but we like Michael Hastings. We like Shock. You know, it's, it's a nice situation. You know, Shock had a little bit of a hamstring the other day. And uh, and with Terrence's knee, you know, Jamichael unfortunately fumbled the ball for a young guy. Hated to see that because he's really special. He's going to be a great back for us. But uh, we've got three really good ones. And Terrence, hopefully he can pick up this Saturday right where he left off uh, down in Austin. All right. Good question. Thank you, Cole. Appreciate that. Here's a question from uh, Tom Gutierrez. Where's Tom in the room? All oh, right there, hey, Tom. Tom. All right, appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Tom says, what is the status of the backup quarterback or quarterbacks to come in for Seth? Well, the, uh, uh, the guy behind Seth, Zach Smith, really special, really special. True freshman, uh, has a big arm, big arm, uh, really can – and a tall guy like 6'5", uh, can really throw it and uh, has developed a better touch. You know, he's got he's always had a live arm, but he's a little bit better on the touch stuff. Uh, we got to see uh, a little bit of him in, against Kansas, you know, and you got, probably saw a couple really nice throws against Kansas. So I feel really good about Zach. Uh, Preston Hurd is a, is a kid along with Zach Bienema that are – those two guys are, are kind of both walk-on kids that both are, you know, kind of fighting to be the third quarterback. Uh, right now, probably Preston's a little bit ahead of Zach. But, uh, you know, our guy right now would be Zach Smith if, if uh, you know, for whatever reason, Seth couldn't go. So let's make sure we keep both those guys yeah. healthy, both good players. I think Seth's really special, and I think Zach's going to be big-time special. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Tom, thanks. Yeah. Good question. All right, here's a, here's a two-for question from Nathan O'Toole. He's got two of them in here. Uh, where's Nathan in the room? All right, right there. Nathan, good questions, both of these. First one, Coach, uh, as we see the Baylor uh, jack-o'-lantern up here, courtesy of Clark McCormick, uh, Nathan says, what was your favorite Halloween costume as a kid? Well, now, you, you, you know, I grew up in West Virginia, and I grew up about a half a block from the railroad tracks. So I absolutely had to be a hobo. You know, that was my deal. And, and trust me, I thought it sounded pretty cool to jump on those buck box cars and ride them around. My mom and dad would have killed me, but, you know, I always uh, thought that would be fun. That's good. Holly, are there pictures? Could we find pictures? No. <laughs> no pictures. Nathan follows She's up. She's just glad I didn't make that a career. Yeah, I know. guess that's true. Worked out well for both of you. If you could dress up today, Nathan says, what would you be? Today. You could have dressed up today. Yeah, you could have come to this show tonight. What would you have dressed as? 
football coach. Football coach. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done very yeah, well. Yeah, with well, that. they might. Some people might think I'm impersonating a football <laughs> coach, but uh, I think yeah. that's great. All right, very good. And Nathan actually had another one on another card. Uh, very simply, he says Chicago Cubs or Cleveland Indians. Cincinnati, Cincinnati Reds. Oh, I'm a Reds fan. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in West Virginia, and, you know, Cincinnati's right down the Ohio River from me. But uh, the, the cool thing, what a great story. Both teams, fantastic. I yeah. mean, great. Hey, I, I think it's going to be tough for the Cubs going back to Cleveland for two games. That's going to make it tough. But yeah. two great, great teams and just really good, good stories. You know, great Both stories. Really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel good stories. Very good. Nathan, thanks. Good questions. We appreciate that. Thanks to those of you for your uh, questions here in this segment. A reminder, this is a green out for the TCU game this week. Everyone in green at the stadium. Uh, that should look great. National television for the game, 2.30 in the afternoon. Weather looks like it is going to be spectacular for the game. And remember to come early. Come to uh, uh, Touchdown Alley and the Bear Walk takes place uh, about two and a half hours prior to, prior to kickoff each week. Be a lot of activities and then the pregame uh, concert series as well uh, prior to the game. All right, let's uh, take our final break and we'll be back and uh, hear about Grobe's greats when we come back. More from Rudy's in a moment on the Baylor Coaches Show. Stay with us. Back inside Rudy's, Rudy's Real Texas Barbecue. Thanks to those of you that are here this evening. I want to give you uh, some uh, notes of upcoming Baylor events this week. Uh, women's basketball begins play tomorrow night. It's an exhibition game. It's Tuesday night, November 1st, 7 o'clock in the Farrell Center against uh, Emporia State. They'll play another exhibition next Monday. Then the regular season, Jeter Baisden begins on Friday, November 11th for the Lady Bears and for the Baylor men. Season tickets are still available for Baylor men's and women's basketball. Volleyball's on the road. They're at Tech on Wednesday night. Soccer opens play in the Big 12 Championships in Kansas City on Wednesday. Baylor soccer uh, left town Monday. They're the number three seed. They play number six seed Oklahoma State on uh, Wednesday evening at 8. And then, of course, Baylor versus TCU Saturday, 2.30 at McLean Stadium. A green out at McLean Stadium, and we're looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, I, I just uh, uh, I need you to be honest here, and these folks are our <laughs> friends. Now, would you think I wouldn't be honest? No, you have been completely okay. honest. But uh, I want to say that as we go into this, uh, you and Gary Patterson are good friends. Yeah, we're buddies. There we're you go, buddies. folks. Is, are you okay with that? We play, play, <laughs> no, play, really. play golf together. I've uh, been on Nike trips. Gary was actually on my ethics committee. And uh, really, really good friends. So it'll be a little different atmosphere. You know, if the game starts, we'll be shaking hands and giving each other a hug. But I promise you, once the game gets going, we'll get after yeah. it. I promise. Do you have a feel for this rivalry, how – yeah, it really is intense. It's intensified the last few years. Well, I have it, especially from watching it, you know, because mm -hmm. Art's a friend. And so I'm watching Art and Gary go at it, and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, my goodness, you know, these guys, these guys take this seriously. Oh, yeah. So just watching the rivalry between Art and Gary gives me a feeling that uh, it's pretty intense. All right. Uh, this last segment, we like to uh, identify what we call uh, Grobe's greats, uh, maybe somebody that you and the coaching staff uh, identified as, as playing really well, practicing really well, that we might not notice who uh, comes to mind to you well a guy that, that I'd, I'd just like to mention uh, and and I really haven't talked to, to Carlton Buckles about uh, you know what he graded and how well all those kind of things but Jamison Houston got thrown into a really crazy situation when when uh, you know when we lost Grayland when he got hurt and then you know had that long delay and then Jamison had to jump out there and start playing on the corner uh, he got beat deep right at the end of the game uh, and, and that was bad, but he was in great position, and the ball was underthrown. You know, and I, I'm thinking interception. As I'm watching, I'm thinking we just picked this ball off, and he's ready to, to get the ball, but it's underthrown, and he actually outran the receiver, and the receiver fell back underneath wow. and caught the football. And like you said, I thought the receiver was going to be out of bounds. It I was so was, close. Yeah. And I, I'm sure Jamison thought when he pinned him that he had him going out and then thought he was going to catch the football. Uh, but he's the one that had to strip on the long run when he chased the guy down and, and, and pulled the ball out. And that saved us a touchdown there. That was a huge, huge play for us. And so uh, just a guy that I thought came in and really competed hard that, uh, uh, you know, those guys always get – 
you know, too much criticism if they give up a play here and there. But, you know, the, the effort that he gave to go down and strip that ball and then, uh, you know, was in great shape. I, w- I, w- I just wish that play had turned out a little different because yeah. I really thought he was getting ready to make a great play, and I Ooh. think he did too. And uh, you guys used a lot of four-man front uh, against Texas and, and their running game. Uh, Xavier Jones uh, really got your attention. Yeah, X is starting to play better and better and better. Really explosive guy, really good pass rusher. Uh, we'll get better. You know, we'll get better at getting our pads down and sinking our cleats in the ground as we go. But that was a great challenge Saturday. They got into some two-back set stuff and were letting their fullback go backside and run an inside zone with that big 250-pounder. And uh, – you know, we tried to give them some movement, and sometimes that was good, and sometimes we kind of missed fitting it right and let the guy get up through there and have some good gains. But I think going forward, we're learning a lot about our personnel and mixing fronts, and I think we'll be better at it. We got caught a couple times, you know, when we should have been in three-man fronts with a four-man front out there, especially when we had 12 guys a couple times. But I think as we go forward, we're going to get more comfortable with mixing those Mm -hmm. two fronts. Mm -hmm. Final couple of minutes we have here. What what have you seen from TCU? They they lost in, uh, I guess, double overtime to Texas Tech on Saturday. Yeah, well, the thing that got got – everybody's attention uh, against Texas Tech was how well they played defense. And, you know, I think Gary Patterson is one of the better defensive coaches in the country. I, you know how much I think of Phil Bennett and our defensive staff. I don't think anybody does a better job than Phil. But uh, Gary's one of the best for sure. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, as the season's gone on, you see them just getting better and better and better on defense. And offensively, they've always been really, really explosive. They went to two quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the main reason, the, the, the kid that was the starter, uh, Hill, uh, had, had thrown an, an interception. And I think he's thrown a few this, this, uh, this fall. I think maybe ten interceptions, if I'm not mistaken. I think he, he threw an interception. And so they decided to go to the, to the, to the other quarterback. And he took them in for a score and did a couple good things. So we're not sure which one we're going to get, but I think we'll pretty much see the same offensive scheme. They'll do about the same things uh, with both both quarterbacks. But it uh, might be another one of those deals where we're going to have to get ready for two. Yeah. Full house, uh, everybody in green. That'll be really sharp on Saturday. Yeah. It's, so this is uh, – I just can't tell you. You know, I've never been around anything like this before the – Baylor, Baylor line and the Golden Wave band and, and uh, the way we start the game and then Baylor Nation and, and sellout crowds and the enthusiasm and, you know, wearing the, everybody getting on the same page with what to wear. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just cool. It's really cool. We appreciate it. We really do. Very good. One of only uh, two remaining home games, so uh, don't miss it this week. 2.30 Saturday, Baylor versus uh, TCU at McLean Stadium. Everyone in green. Coach, appreciate it. Thanks for the visit. Thanks, Look forward Jamie. to Saturday. Yes, sir we got to get back on the winning track. Hang in there with these guys. they got a lot of good kids. We'll absolutely do that. All right, looking forward to it Saturday. Baylor and TCU will be back here next Monday evening. Hope you can be with us then for our next Baylor Coaches Show, 6 p.m. Central Time on Monday, each, uh, each and every Monday except – the following Monday, November 14th, we'll be here uh, not on the 14th, but on Tuesday, the 15th. I'm already confused. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll put it on your calendar and tell Carly. How about that? There you go. And That'll Diane. do it. That'll, That'll get us both it. here. Yep. All right. Appreciate you all being with us. Thanks very much. For Coach Grobe, I'm John Morris. We say.